we're all on, a, on an adventure. This whole universe is on an adventure. Well, it's really much more than what we think of when we say the word universe. It's very limited, actually, even though we may think it's, it's infinite and infinitely expanding. Our notion of the universe is very limited. I mean, we're talking about um, a master tonight, Unmon, who who is who has really um, let himself go completely, and is therefore quite extraordinarily um, open to the sort of infinite number of infinities <laughs> that there are. That, that if we conceive of an infinite universe and then imagine that there are an infinite number of them and they're all right here, then we'd be getting closer to Unmon's state of mind and Unmon's experience. That it's all, you know, even if we say something like, um, well, there's multi, the multiverse, you know, there's another universe somewhere. The idea that it might actually be right here, right now, in the very core of our experience, somehow doesn't seem to make sense to us. You know? But I think it makes clear sense to Unma, and he's often trying to share that in multiple brilliant ways. And, and um, so tonight's case is case 83 of the Blue Cliff Record. And um, it's a short one as many of Unmon's cases are. It's called The Old Buddha and the Pillar. Unmon spoke to the assembly saying, the Old Buddha and the Pillar intermingle with each other. What level of activity is this? And then as usual, nobody re dares reply. <laughs> so he speaks in their place saying, Clouds arise on South Mountain, rain falls on North Mountain. And that's the end of the case. And then there's a lovely verse by Secha, which, we'll, which I'd like to go through tonight. But before we go any further, let me just read a, a poem that somebody sent me recently by an American poet called Marie Howe. What the Living Do. Because I think it relates not only to this case and kind, but to the whole core of our practice, why we're doing it. What the living do. Johnny, the kitchen sink has been clogged for days. Some utensil probably fell down there. And the drainer won't, won't work, but it smells dangerous. And the crusty dishes have piled up waiting for the plumber I still haven't called. This is the everyday we spoke of. It's winter again. The skies are deep, headstrong blue, and the sunlight pours through the open living room windows because the heat's on too high in here and I can't turn it off. For weeks now, driving or dropping a bag of groceries in the street, the bag breaking, I've been thinking, this is what the living do. And yesterday, hurrying along those wobbly bricks in the Cambridge sidewalk, spilling my coffee down my wrist and sleeve. I thought it again, and again later when buying a hairbrush. This is it. Parking, slamming the car door shut in the cold. What you called that yearning. What you finally gave up. We want the spring to come and the winter to pass. We want whoever to call or not call, a letter, a kiss, we want more and more and then more of it. But there are moments, walking, when I catch a glimpse of myself in the window glass, say, the window of the corner video store, and I'm gripped by a cherishing so deep for my own blowing hair, chapped face and unbuttoned coat that I'm speechless. I am living. I remember you.
Oh, well, I think that's a pretty good poem myself. Um, and it's about, well, I don't want to reduce it, really, but it, among other things, uh, obviously, it's about dying. It's called What the Living Do. He's gone. And she hasn't. And she's noticed that. Stray moment, glimpse of myself in a shop window, my hair blowing. I'm gripped by a cherishing so deep. Um, that's, that's really a great expression of this practice. It's a cherishing so deep that I'm speechless. I am living. I remember you. That's what I'm doing right now. Now, you know, on some level, we all know it's gone in a blink. I mean, you know, whoever thought we'd already be the age we are, each of us, right? It goes so fast and they say it just goes faster and faster, and that's certainly been my experience. It's a, one of those little flip books and it just accelerates as you go through it. It's like going the first time round the track is kind of fascinating and everything's interesting. And the second time round it's a little bit quicker and a little bit less is noticed. And third time round we notice still less, fourth time round less, and it gets quicker and quicker and quicker. January comes before you know it. But wait a minute, what do you mean? I'm, I'm only just getting used to the new year. <laughs> it's already the next year. You know, some of you may know what I'm talking about, that kind of experience. But, 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 there's practice. The last week's koa with great dragon, Dai Ryu, the monk asked, the body of form is destroyed. This body, this very body of mine, perishes. The flowers on the altar, they're gone already. We've got new flowers this week. They're dead. Each of those flowers will never come back. Just remember that. Each one will not come back. And the same is true of all our loved ones, of course, who have died not coming back. But when the monk asked Dai Ryu, the body of form, this material body, dies, decays, is gone, what is the indestructible Dharma body? Dai Ryu answers him, look at the beautiful autumn foliage, looks like embroidery. Look at the deep blue indigo of the water flowing down the valley, the river, under the afternoon sky or the evening sky. It's a beautiful indigo, which might last half an hour. That's your indestructible Dharma body. That is the, that is the very thing that never perishes. That's what he is saying. Now this, actually once again, I mean this kind tonight is actually about precisely the same point really, from a slightly different angle. Unmon says the old Buddha and the pillar intermingle with each other. So what does he mean by the old Buddha? What's this old Buddha he's talking about? That's really the the key to this koan is understanding and experiencing what he means by the old Buddha. The pillar is just a pillar, you know, it's, you, you might as well, uh, the pillar is, is a standing for the monk's perishing body, you know, it could be the stick, it could be the floor. The, the old Buddha and the floor intermingle with each other. The old Buddha 
and the tree intermingle with each other. The pillar is quite a nice choice, really, because um, the world of form, I mean, the zendo is upheld, I suspect, in this case, by pillars. So there's a pillar holding up the Zen hall. And that pillar and the old Buddha intermingle with each other. So what does he mean by intermingle, and what does he really mean by the old Buddha? Who is the old Buddha? What is the old Buddha? Maybe it's something rather like a body of form. Maybe it's, or I'm sorry, the Dharma body. Maybe the Dharma body is rather like the old Buddha. And the pillar is rather like this flesh and blood body that we know will, you know, get increasingly inefficient and decrepit and malfunctioning. Increasingly. I mean, whatever, um, you know, whatever physical ailments we may have, you know, the sort of first two-thirds of life, we're kind of used to the idea that they'll get better. But as we get a little bit older, we start to realize that some of them don't get better. They're here to stay. Um, I'm sorry, I don't want to sound too gloomy. But that's the case. That's the case, you know. And it's okay. The point of Zen is to realize Fundamentally, it's absolutely fine. It's okay. It's okay that this perishing body perishes. It's okay that all the people we love also will be gone. That we will fundamentally lose everything. I mean, the first session that um, my teacher Ryoan Roshi ever gave in North America, you know, he began by saying everything we have we will lose. Health, any prosperity we, we may have, status, friendships, relationships, love, we'll lose it. 